lot like people. Every plant needs a different diet. Did you ever notice that? Did you ever walk through the gardening section? There's food for African violets and food for outside plants and food for your grass and food for... People are a lot like that too. It takes us... We get different things depending on our nature. Just like the Christmas cactus eats a little different than the violet or the tomato. And our life is like a garden with our relationship with God, what we tend grows. Did you know that? It's true in your fleshly relationships, your marriage or your friendships. What you tend grows and what you neglect dies and fades away to nothing. And today I'd like to take a little time and talk about some different types of gardens. Now, everyone has seen a flower garden or a vegetable garden. Are the two growing together? Because some plants help each other, like marigolds, keep away insects from tomato plants. And a lot of times you'll see a row of a row of uh, tomatoes and next to it a row of marigolds because people want to keep the insects away from their plants. But I'd like to explore some different kinds of gardens than just the common garden. And the first kind of garden I'd like to talk about is the rock garden. So my little rock right there. Now there are three things to consider when you start building a garden. One is, where, what is the location of your garden? When you build a rock garden, the location needs to capitalize on the environment that's already present. Most of the times when people build a rock garden, it's on a rocky, on a slope. And the reason they do that because, well, we'll get to that in a minute. The makeup of the garden is because uh, you, it's made of rocks, because it's a rock garden. And usually people create, uh, they get round, raised things, and they get perfect rocks. They import the rocks and bring them in to where they're going to plant their garden. And when they bring in the rocks, they find the perfect rock to fit in every little nook and cranny as they build the rock garden up. And the reason they build the rock garden on the slope is so that there's good drainage. Now the maintenance on a rock garden is very, very low. You might take your leaf blower out there once in a while and blow the leaves away, but the maintenance on a leaf blower is very, very low. Well, what does this have to do in your life? I'm so glad you asked. In the Bible, in the book of Joshua, chapter 4 of Kings, it says that it came to pass when all of the people were clean passed over the Georgian, Jordan that the Lord spoke unto Joshua, saying, Take ye twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man, and command ye them, saying, Take ye hence out of the midst of the Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and you carry them over with you. You lift them up out of the middle of the Jordan. When you're going through that experience that may not be so great, you lift up a rock or a stone out and you carry them over with you and you leave them in the lodging place where you shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men, whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe of man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over. Before the ark of the Lord your God. Who's going with you? The Lord your God. Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan and take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. That this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come saying, what mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them, that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. What? When you go through your Jordan experience, your deep, hard experience, the Lord goes ahead and makes a way. So then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over the Jordan. And the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did it so as Joshua commanded. And they took up twelve stones out of the midst of the Jordan. Out of the midst of their trial. Out of the midst of their hard time. They lifted up a stone. And as the Lord spake unto Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and they carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged, and they laid them down there. And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan. 
wait just a minute. I've already built this thing when I made it through. But in the middle of your trial, you can build a rock garden. You can build up a memorial. And Joshua set up the 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests which bear the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there unto this day. Wouldn't you love for people who come behind you to look back at the hard time that you've been through and see a memorial set up there that says, I made it through. I made it through. And if they walk through the same valley that you walk through, if one day the Jordan is parted for them and God has made a way and they're walking through that trial, they can look right in the middle of the trial. And see there a place, a rock garden, set up that glorifies the God who helped you through your hard time. The second kind of garden I want to talk about is the water garden. A water garden has to be located in a certain place too. First of all, you want people to, people to be able to see your water garden. But it's going to be important that you put your water garden where runoff from rain cannot contaminate it with chemicals or fertilizers or all kinds of organic debris. And it needs some sun, four to six hours of sun. What's inside of a water garden? Well, a water garden contains goldfish and aquatic, aquatic plants. So how do you take care of what's the maintenance on this water garden? It's higher. A water garden has to be aerated. There has to be some kind of a water a system that's running air through it. Also to become stagnant, become covered with that green slime that nobody likes to see. And a water garden has to be closed for the winter time. What does this say in your life? I'm so glad you asked. In John 7, 38, it says, He that believeth in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now, if you have a water garden, and in the winter time, you cover it up, or ice will cover the top of the water garden. And it will look like nothing is going on inside of there. But deep down, underneath all of the water, in the depths of the water garden, those little goldfish are still swimming around. Deep in the bottom of the water garden, there is life. In the dry season, the water garden can keep that water flowing, which the water is typical of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes you may feel like in your life, nothing is happening. Lord, where are you? I don't feel your presence. I cry out to heaven, but the heavens are brass. But I'm going to tell you something deep down within you. The Bible says, he that believeth on me, if you believe in him and you trust him, as the scripture saith, if you're following the word of God, out of his belly shall flow those rivers of living water. The power of the Holy Spirit is deep inside of there. It's still churning around inside of there. How many ever heard somebody say, there may be snow on the roof, but there's fire in the furnace. That's just what it's like spiritually for you. You may think there's snow on the roof, but there's still fire in the furnace. The next kind of garden I want to talk about is a poison garden. The largest poison garden is located in Alnwick Castle in England and was established in 1750. There are 42 acres of poisons. A man named the Duke of Northumberland was a plant collector and he went all over collecting plants. He was the first person to bring a pineapple to England. He built a garden called the Avenue of Flowers but he also built a poison garden. Now, what is the makeup of a poison garden? It's intoxicating plants, poisonous plants, strychnine, hemlock, foxglove. At the beginning of the poison garden, there is a huge sign that has a skull and a crossbones on it, and it says these plants can kill. How do you maintain them? such a garden? Very careful. A story is told of Corrie Ted Boone. And she was a little girl and she learned a new word to her. And the word was sex. And Corrie Ted Boone didn't know what the word meant. But she went to her grandfather and asked him what it meant. 
And her grandfather said to her, Corey, do you see Papa's briefcase over there? I want you to pick it up and bring it over there, over here too. And she went over there and she tried to pick it up, but it was too heavy. And she said, I can't pick it up, it's too heavy. And he said, that's just how this information is. He said, when the time is right and you're able to lift up the case, I'm going to explain that to you. But for now, can you trust your grandpa that it's too much for you to know? How many of you guys have been through a trial like that? Where you could not understand what was happening. The Bible says if we're called according to his purpose, for following his voice, all things are working together for our good. <clears throat> Did you know in this poison garden that's so intoxicating that the skull and crossbones has to be there, out of some of the plants inside the poison garden come medicines that save your life and save mine. Out of this poison garden comes Warfarin, which is a blood thinner. It's used for rat poison. But it's also used to save your life. Out of this poison garden comes a venom that can be used as a pain reliever like morphine. The foxglove that is highly poisonous makes digitalis for people who have heart trouble. Out of this garden comes the hemlock plant, which is used as a sedative. And out of this garden comes a plant called ergo, which is used to treat migraine headaches. So you may ask me, thanks for asking, how does this apply to my life? You have poison experiences. How many of you guys have had bad things happen to you? I could name some of your poison experience. They are what you make of them, though. You can think about those things as deadly and let them kill you, or you can overcome that poison experience. Sometimes God uses a seemingly poisonous experience to burn something out of our life that no longer needs to be there. <clears throat> How? How do you overcome this poisonous experience? By the word of God and the power of your testimony. Think of a few poison experiences in the Bible. The widow who had two sons. And they were going to come and repossess her sons. Remember that? Because her husband had died. She's a widow in a country where women mean nothing. She's without a protector. No one in her family has stepped into help her. And now she is about to lose her prized possessions. Think about Ruth and Naomi. Naomi went out, charged up and ready to go, and came back with a name meaning bitter. Think about the widow in the Bible who the prophet comes to her and asks her for a cake, and all she has is a little meal and a little oil, and she says, Me and my son are going to eat this cake and die! That's a poison experience. Think about the three Hebrew children kidnapped from their country, drug across the earth, smart and intelligent, and asked to bow before an image that they knew they could not bow before. And they stand up for God, and God doesn't deliver them right then. No, oh, what happens? The furnace gets heated hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. Think of Jesus in the garden. When he prayed to the Father and said, Father, oh, Father, let this cup pass for me. Their poison was just a stepping stone to what the next garden I want to talk about is. And the next garden I want to talk about is the victory garden. I once read a story about a man who was a king. And he had a beautiful daughter and he wished to give her hand in marriage, but only to one who was destined to be the next king. And he looked all over the kingdom and he couldn't find anyone. So he, he derived a plan to choose a husband for his daughter. He chose three strong looking men to come. 
And he said to them, if you can pass through the poison forest and come out on the other side, the first one through will be the husband of my beautiful daughter. So one that he chose was the cleverest. One he chose was the mightiest. And one that he chose was the swiftest. They said, King, if we get deep in the forest, how will we ever find our way out? How will we find it to the place where we're supposed to be? How will we find it back to the castle? And he said, every night when the sun gets ready to go down, I will stand on the edge of the castle and I will play my flute. And when you hear this song, you listen. And you follow this song and you will be able to make it back to the palace. Now the poison forest was full of brambles and briars and everything you could imagine that would deter you from your way. He said to these three young men, you may each choose a companion to go with you. One of them asked, does anyone else know this song? And he said, well, yeah, just me and my son, that's all that know this song. So they chose their companions and the king outfitted them with beautiful armor with a tall flag on a post and a wonderful horses to ride. And they set out one day at the sound of the bugle to make their way through the poison forest. Every evening at dusk, the king would stand on the edge of the castle here, and he would play the song. And the people of the village would gather around and look out, waiting for someone to come out of the poison forest and into the place where they could see them. But day after day went by, and no one came out of the forest. And finally, one night at dusk, as the king played the horn, out of the forest came two ragged men far away. No horse. No tall flag on a stick. Their armor was missing, and their clothes were shredded. And he told all the people, go in, go in. And tonight, at midnight, we will have a banquet and we will introduce you to the new prince. So all the people went back into the castle. And they brought the two men in and they cleaned them up. And they brought them to the door of the, of the banquet room at midnight. And the king played the song and the doors opened and out walked Caspian the cleverest. And he stood before them. And they said to him, the people asked, How, Caspian, how did you make it through the dark forest, through the poison forest? And he said, I wandered many days in the poison forest, and somewhere along the way I lost the one the swiftest and the one that was the mightiest. But the reason that I made it through the poison forest is because every night when the sound of the flute would play, I had the right companion. And they said to him, who is this companion you took with you through the po poison forest? And the doors to the, to the, to the banquet room flew open again and out watch walked the prince, the one who knew the song. And Caspian said, every night when you would begin to play the flute, the worst thing of all would happen. All around me in the forest were these hope knots, these creatures who wanted to crush me and grind me to dust. And they would begin to play their little flute too. And I could barely discern what was going on, but he said I would turn to my companion and I would say, help me. And the companion would begin, the prince would begin to play the flute and I would hear the song of the king in both the ears. And I could draw closer to the castle. The victory garden. The victory garden. In 1946, at the end of the at the end of the World War, at the very beginning, people had begun in their location, in their own yard, or in a public area, they began to build these victory gardens. 
There were certain slogans for these victory gardens. In Canada, they said a vegetable garden for every home. In the United Kingdom, they said digging for victory. In the USA, they said our food is fighting. What were these gardens made out of? They were made of food. They were for a morale booster in the midst of a hard time. So what happened in the maintenance of these gardens? In 1946, at the end of the war, the British people did not replant their gardens. The war was over. They thought their food shortage had ended, but it remained, and in Great Britain, there was rationing until 1954, eight years after the World War was over, because they gave up their victory garden. There are still victory gardens in the Back Bay Glens in Boston and in the Dowling Community Gardens in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Now you may say, how does this apply to my life? There are no victories at discount prices. You're going to walk through the rocky place. You're going to feel sometimes like you've been frozen over. You're going to come to the point where it seems like poisonous circumstances are going to overcome you. But you know what? If you ask that widow when her two sons were about to be repossessed and her crews of oil never gave up, though she filled bucket after bucket after and vessel after, if you ask that widow who, when the prophet said to her, make me a cake first. And she had said, we're going to eat this little cake and die. And she made the cake from the meal and the oil and baked it and gave it to the prophet. And what does the Bible say for the rest of that famine? There was meal in the pot and oil in the vessel. If you ask the children of Israel, or I mean, if you ask the three Hebrew boys when they were thrown into the fiery furnace and the furnace was heated so hot that the that the people that threw them in were killed and the ropes that held them were burnt off, but they turned to the right and what did they see? The, the fourth man, the son of man, walking with them in the fire. And then they walk out unscathed, maybe not even smelling like smoke. They went through a poisonous experience, a hard time, a rock. If you ask Naomi, when she came back and she was bitter, she lost everything, her husband, her her children. She came back with nothing, but what did God give her? She's in the lineage. She held that baby that was the forerunner to King David and eventually to Jesus Christ himself. In these types of gardens, sometimes it seems like we forget when we're going through this experience a little song I sung last week. When you've done all that you can, stand on his word. When you've stood all you can stand, you do what you've learned. Remember all you've read is true. God will always bring you through. Amen. In spite of everything you've heard, you stand on his word. Now I'll tell you, in a garden today, when people plant a garden, they stand up a scarecrow. My mom used to stand, put up stakes and tie little banquet pot pie aluminum pans to the end of them. And they'd wave on the end of a piece of yarn and keep the crows away and from eating the tomatoes and all that kind of stuff. And people today in their garden raise up a scarecrow, which looks like a man, because they think it'll keep the the crows and the birds from coming down and pecking on their tomatoes and eating their strawberries. But you know when you've gone through a poison experience or a rocky experience or a deep experience where you feel like you don't know where the Lord is, instead of putting up a scarecrow to chase things away, Jesus Christ said this, And if I, and if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. If when you go through the, through the rocky experience, if you can take those rocks and build a memoriam, if when you go through the deep times and it seems like you don't feel the presence of the Lord, know that springtime's coming and things are going to thaw out. When you go through the poison garden and it seems like the very gates of hell are trying to prevail against you, I can tell you now if you lift Jesus up and when you come out the other side, 
God, if you'll lift him up, people will look at your experiences and they won't see defeat. They'll see victory. Today is Communion Sunday. Hallelujah. And although Jesus in a garden said, Father, let this cup pass for me, he went on through. He went through that deep experience when it seemed like things were poison, when one of his own people betrayed him for money. He walked through that experience. He walked through the Last Supper. He walked through it knowing what was coming. And though the devil might have been rejoicing, thinking he had him under the water or crushed by a rock, or it poisoned that experience. <clears throat> Jesus Christ rose again. He rose again for you at the ultimate victory. Yeah. And when we take communion, do you know what? We drink the cup and we eat the bread and we show his death, what? Until he comes. That story is not over. Brother Harley, come on up. That story is not over. We're eating of the bread and we're drinking of the cup because we're signifying his death, but that's not the end of the sentence. We're signifying his death until he comes. He is coming back. The story is not over. The garden hasn't been finished yet. But what seemed like poison, ah, hallelujah, what seemed like poison is a victory garden today because of the cross of Calvary and because my God is not lying in a grave. My Savior is not buried in the ground, but he is risen and he lives inside of me. I'd like our brethren come to come today. Oh, his blood still avails. The victory is still yours. It wasn't left on a cross. Didn't end at Calvary. Oh, it's the blood. It gives me strength from day to day. It will